Hello, this is Randy White. I'm a business development manager for Rogan Schwartz. Today I'm going to talk about one of my favorite tools, and that is time domain reflectometry. We're going to use TDR to focus on how to best solve signal integrity problems. So let's start with the basic uh, architecture of a typical system, meaning transmitter, channel, and receiver. And as you can clearly see, the signal quality uh, as it originates from the transmitter starts out fairly well. And when it passes through the channel, um, there's some distortion, some uh, attenuation, and other effects that cause uh, signal degradation. We're all familiar with this. And so somehow the receiver needs to uh, interpret this uh, signal and uh, properly detect the data. Um, the challenge that we run into is this channel that is causing the distortion. How we can best um, debug this and find out where the potential problems are so we can then correct that. There's a lot of uh, sources of, of problems with signal integrity. Uh, today, um, I would lump the issue, the types of issues that you might run into as three different types. Number one is the bandwidth limiting effects of your channel, which would obviously cause signal loss and attenuation. Um, next, there might be interferes, so outside sources of noise coupling in, switch mode power supplies, or adjacent signals on lanes next to your uh, signal that you're measuring. Or even within the channel itself, of course, reflections um, and, or impedance mismatches. And that's really the area that we're going to focus on in this video. So the classic go-to uh, evaluation method for most uh, high-speed designs is to simply look at an eye diagram. This might be t uh, testing our signal against a known mask or template. Or it could just be using a prescribed uh, clock recovery system uh, on our scope. But here you can see many different uh, anomalies that we need, might need to address. Okay, we have a slower rise time causing the mass to fail, fill. And that's obviously because of our channel effects. Uh, we might have jitter from different sources that's also um, shrinking the eye. And there might be noise coupling in from the power rail or from crosstalk. And of course, reflections might uh, degrade our uh, performance as well. So let's look at uh, the go-to tool of choice for uh, addressing uh, channel or interconnect issues um, in digital designs. That's time domain reflectometry. This is essentially like a radar. If you think, out, think of radar sending out a pulse and measuring the response, and based on the information that you know about the outgoing pulse versus the incoming pulse, you can then discern uh, distance, um, the uh, differences between your source and your target uh, channel or, or impedance variations that you're looking at. And so this is essentially what TDR does, is it sends out uh, like, like kind of a radar signal to try to capture the signature of the channel that you're looking at. This can also be, uh, ex this concept of TDR can be extended to TDT, time domain transmission, where instead of looking at a reflected pulse, you now measure at the far end of your channel, at the opposite end, say, let's call it that, the output, of the system that you're measuring and looking at the response there. So that would give you some information about, say, the attenuation of the channel. You can also use TDR to measure crosstalk between different lanes. And of course, the classic, uh, one of my favorite benefits of TDR is for identifying and locating faults in the system, opens, shorts, um, partial connections, things, things like that. Very very intuitive if you're a time domain person. Um, the other aspect of TDR that needs to be considered is the rise time. And I'll get into this uh, a little bit later on in the video. But unlike uh, classical um, test equipment, especially scopes where the uh, specifications are focused around bandwidth, you know, frequency range of, of, of interest, 
TDR is more about rise time because that determines the um, resolution of the impedance discontinuities that, that you're measuring. Finally, some, uh, another important aspect is that your TDR system should match the topology that you're using in your design. So if you're using single-ended or differential, uh, or in this case, odd mode um, propagation, uh, it's important that you also measure TDR in that same mode. So that way you can um, see the same response that, you're, that the real system would see. So I mentioned uh, before the importance of rise time versus system bandwidth. Now, rise time is directly related to bandwidth based on a, a simple conversion factor. And uh, a bandwidth, of course, we can match to the test equipment based on the scope bandwidth we're measuring or the connector type that we're using to attach to our boards or cables. Um, but the rise time ultimately will determine the smallest resolution or, or, or spacing that we can determine on a board or, or another interconnect. Uh, another important thing is to ensure that you have a nice, um, well-behaved, uh, flat step for your uh, outgoing pulse. This is, you know, this is going back to the analogy of the radar signal. We want our, our radar signal to look as clean as possible without any ringing or overshoot, which would make um, our analysis uh, much more difficult to pull out which part of the ringing is uh, based on the board or, or cable or system, the system that we're measuring versus the actual test equipment. And finally, the uh, differential TDR, TDT measurements. It's very important that we launch our TDR signals um, a time aligned, and so our cabling and, and um, connections need to be properly de-skewed if needed. So to simplify that, it's, it's easiest just that we recommend a, a phase match to cables. So there's two types of uh, instruments uh, that I'd like to talk about today that offer some TDR capabilities. The first is a real-time oscilloscope. This is the Roding Schwartz RTO RTP oscilloscope uh, configuration that I'm showing here. The TDR is managed uh, is uh, configured through uh, an integrated uh, pulse module and this pulse module is a 16 gigahertz differential source. Um, the, obviously the benefit here is now you've got all your other signal integrity tools like jitter and eye diagram and uh, voltage timing measurements all built into one box so you can look at you know start your debug workflow looking at eye diagrams and doing timing analysis, and then also looking at your interconnects and channel effects using TDR all in the same box. It's very convenient. Another instrument that is also very useful and has definitely has some advantages over oscilloscopes is the Vector Network Analyzer. This example here is the ZNB uh, Network Analyzer. Uh, these can range from, you know, a few gigahertz up to 40, 40 gigahertz um, frequency range. Of course, there's uh, four port and uh, um, even many more ports available. Um, VNAs are typically frequency domain instruments where we're sweeping at different frequencies up to our, our max range. And then based on this um, span of frequencies that we have, we can then use an inverse FFT operation to then look at our, uh, our response in the time domain. Here's a comparison table showing just side by side some of the um, advantages of one instrument over the other. Uh, main thing being one is time domain, the other is frequency domain based. Um, when you're narrow band you can then uh, filter out uh, more broadband noise uh, while still covering the range of frequency range of interest. Um, oscilloscope has more uh, integrated debug capabilities. Maybe it's more intuitive if you think um, time domain based. So each has its advantages and disadvantages. So I talked about some of the different types of equipment 
Now I'd like to ask a question to you, uh, thinking through the setup, um, because there's a lot of different uh, RF connectors out there when we're using different cabling. Um, what, according to your knowledge, what is the recommended upper frequency limit of the 3.5 millimeter coaxial connector? Here's a table showing the different uh, theoretical frequency limits as well as the usable uh, frequency limit uh, for different connector types. Here we're showing for uh, precision grade 3.5 millimeter uh, connector. The usable frequency is on the order of 33 gigahertz. Um, so of course the smaller diameter um, uh, connector type that we use, the higher the frequency range uh, of interest. Now, speaking of uh, um, frequency range and also uh, rise time, I would like to go in briefly and talk about how the resolution is impacted or affected by the rise time. So first of all, let's remember that the system rise time of our measurement uh, system is a root sum of squares of the oscilloscope plus the pulse source and also any cabling that we include in the test equipment setup. So this dictates together as a whole the actual measurement uh, performance. Now coming back to the analogy of the radar signal being applied for TDR or at least explaining how TDR works the parameter that we use to describe the reflection of the TDR signal is called rho, and this is the symbol indicated in green. Rho is the ratio of the reflected voltage level divided by the incident voltage level. So you could see that rho would span from minus one for a short circuit all the way up to one for an open circuit. So for a perfect match, where the source impedance is equal to the characteristic impedance, we expect no reflected voltage. So zero divided by one volt, let's say, would be zero, and that's how we end up with rho of zero for a match. Now to convert to impedance, we, we need to use this um, uh, more of a nonlinear formula. So 1 plus rho divided by 1 minus rho multiplied by the characteristic impedance. And that's how we uh, convert between, the, uh, between rho and uh, impedance. And this is all done automatically on the, on the oscilloscope, of course. I'd like to bring to your attention uh, a standards group that has done a lot of work for many years in providing best practices, recommended uh, procedures for improving accuracy and optimizing a TDR-based setup. Um, there's a number of applications that this group, the IPC group, um, provides uh, details around things like torquing your connectors to make sure you get repeatable results, ESD protection, how to calculate the, your effective resolution, your temporal or spatial resolution based on the rise time of the system. So I highly recommend that you go to IPC.org. If you'd like to learn more information about um, test methodologies, best practices around TDR. Now with that, now I'd like to come to my second uh, question of the day. Uh, that is, why is a 50 ohm impedance the most common characteristic impedance that's used today. Why not 75? Why not 200? Well, it turns out the characteristic impedance is a function of the inner diameter of the center conductor over the um, outer uh, dielectric diameter multiplied by some, some other factors. And if you look at this impedance and vary it across different, uh, different applications, looking at uh, how, does this, how does the impedance vary as a function of 
um, I, I'm sorry, how does the uh, attenuation vary as a function of impedance? Or how does the power transfer uh, vary as a function of impedance? And by graphing both of these together, we could see that um, the optimum impedance for uh, uh, lowest attenuation is around 77 ohms. And for max power transfer, um, the ideal impedance uh, with minimal loss would be um, 30 ohms. So 50 ohms is sort of a compromise. And if you think about it, you, it makes sense. A lot of um, a lot of applications that use long uh, cable lengths, like video applications, have standardized on 75 ohms. So there's advantages with using different types of characteristic impedance depending upon the application. But for a lot of uh, basic um, electronics design, 50 ohm seems to satisfy the needs of both worlds, both uh, power transfer as well as optimizing for a, a minimum attenuation. So here's an example for differential traces where uh, 85 ohm actually was ideal, in this case for a PCI Express application. So here's an example using the RTP oscilloscope, uh, just to quickly gauge the uh, line length. Uh, we could see that this is about two nanoseconds long because I have an open circuit and I'm measuring from start to end. I can see the discontinuities from the connectors as uh, showing up as ringing. And I see the quality of the termination after I uh, terminate the cables. And I still see the um, SMA connector uh, discontinuities. Now I'd like to talk about how the calibration is done on the RTP oscilloscope. And so step one, we select the, the, the configuration for our measurement. Is this TDR, TDT, or both? single-ended or differential. Second step, we would then, uh, this is essentially a three-step process. So we connect a short, then we leave the cables open. That's considered our open. Finally, we apply a match. And based on this, the software can then determine the, the correct uh, calibration settings, which you can then actually see on the very far right here with the plot showing the effective um, insertion loss of the uh, cabling that we're using. Once we're done calibrating, then we can turn on our measurement. This is our main control for TDR. We have a couple of different parameters shown. We can increase the averages, which would reduce our noise, our random noise on the scope. We could change the bandwidth to match the system that, we, that we're using. So if we're only testing, let's say, USB 2.0, and the effective bandwidth is maybe a few gigahertz, it probably would make sense to reduce the bandwidth of, our, of the TDR measurement to from 16 gigahertz down to 1 or 2 gigahertz. This other setting, domain, allows us to change the horizontal scale units from either time in nanoseconds or picoseconds to uh, distance. It could be um, millimeters or inches. And of course, when we select that, then we get a, a, another field that allows us to enter our dielectric constant, which would be needed to convert time to distance. Uh, here's a quick example that uh, we were debugging. Uh, this is a, as you can see, this is a multi-lane high-speed bus. One of the signals had an issue and so we uh, we use our TDR with a browser probe and we contacted one side to the other from the top of our the screen uh, PCB trace and we could measure from start to at the point where the signal went to open high impedance and we could tell that not only was there an open circuit but there also was a uh, looks like a solder a bad solder connection between two traces and which caused uh, this uh, screenshot in the bottom where the impedance didn't quite go high impedance but there was certainly some coupling going on and now we know 
the exact distance of, of the problem. Here's a quick uh, view of uh, how to measure a microstrip using a positioner. This is a XYZ positioner. This, this particular tip was a, a half a millimeter uh, pitch. And I were coming down straight on these two traces. So because it's differential, there's no ground reference and we can just probe directly. Now uh, I'm gonna show you an example of a DDR memory module and this is looking at the differential clock, trying to understand the quality of the um, differential clock path. Um, here's a layout view. So we're going to probe on the gold fingers um, and follow the clock signal clock path as it goes uh, down to its uh, signal layer, passes through each um, component and then at the far end it's terminated. So I'd like to measure both the quality of the signal path using TDR as well as um, the propagation delay of the, the entire path itself. So we're coming down on the launch using this uh, pro positioner and here's a view of, you can see the gold fingers on the bottom, bottom right where we're measuring. And here's another view of the setup with the uh, scope and finally, here are our results. So you can tell the impedance uh, drops very quickly from its nominal 100 ohm um, system impedance down to about uh, 80 ohms. And we see a couple of discontinuities because of the uh, stubs on the signal path. And then after about uh, five or six nanoseconds, the termination resistors, uh, we signal reaches the, the terminations. Later on, I remove those termination resistors because now I'd like to use the open circuit at the far end of the channel to determine the delay of the path. And so for, based on the TDR and TDT response on the right side, I see it, it's about seven nanoseconds. So I hope this uh, video was useful. I highlighted uh, two different types of uh, equipment, uh, real-time oscilloscope and uh, VNA for TDR, making TDR measurements. The examples I went through used the uh, Roden Schwartz RTP um, high, high bandwidth oscilloscope. We used um, the built-in TDR capabilities. After calibrating, we could measure both um, do fault location as well as measuring propagation delay and even looking at the impedance profile of a DDR memory system. There's a lot of other tools built into this instrument, um, jitter, de-embedding, and all these things come together to complement this as a very nice uh, debugging instrument. Thank you.